Um, I want to, um, you, you guys remember me, so I'm Heather Autom, I play Native and Non-Western Art, and um, I just want to ask you, if you will, to silence your phones. We are recording this. And um, if you have to take a phone call, I've got kids, I understand, but if you'll step outside the auditorium to do so, it would be and um, in the course of all this, I just don't want to forget the partners I have in the museum that have helped to make this possible today. So I want to recognize Karen Bowles, who's um, done all the administrative work, Jessica uh, Farling, who, wave your hand, Jessica. You guys should know Jessica. If you don't, she should be your friend here. She's our director of public engagement, and she'll be managing all the technical things um, today. And then also, uh, this is all possible because of the support that um, I received from our director, Mark White, for the Enter the Matrix exhibition and um, working with the Native community. So I'm going to do a brief um, introduction, if you don't mind, Miss Melanie. Um, Melanie Yazzie, as a printer, printmaker, painter, and sculptor, uh, draws upon her rich Diné Navajo cultural heritage. Her work follows the Diné dictum, walk in beauty, which literally translates to creating beauty and harmony. She received her degrees from Arizona State University and the University of Colorado at Boulder. She's taught printmaking at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, which is actually where I got to meet her. Um, she's also taught at the University of Arizona in Tucson and at Boise State University in Boise and is currently serving as area coordinator and professor of printmaking at the University of Colorado at Boulder. She also uh, serves as faculty and executive board member for the Center for Native American and Indigenous Studies, also at UC Boulder. Yazi creatively uses the motifs from many indigenous cultures with whom she has engaged to create multi-layered monotypes that focus on the stories that are abundantly shared within these exchanges. Through these recognizable motifs and using references to local figures, flora, and fauna, Yazi's imagery creates um, provides access into the intimate relationship that exists for the community to places and to each other. The personal engagement is a critical component for her artistic practice as she focuses on supporting cultural vitality, fostering creativity, and nurturing a healthful environment within the studio and those working with her. And so please join me in welcoming Melanie to our chat today. So. So, um, hey Mel. Hi. Um, so the first question that I have for you is that um, the students have uh, received the handouts that you provided where you can see her painting and her printmaking samples and also her sculpture images. Um, in Enter the Matrix, we have prints from our um, James Bialet collection that include um, monotypes by you. And then we have the five works that we borrowed from your collection for the exhibition that are collaborations between you and five separate Maori artists in, from New Zealand. Um, so the first question really comes back to the materials. And because you work in so many, so many different kinds of materials, how and when does printmaking become your medium of choice? Um, I think it, it all starts with printmaking because um, it's just what I go to naturally. Well, I guess my sketchbooks would be something that I would um, start with. And when I'm sketching, it can turn into a print, um, a, uh, a sculpture piece, something that I'm going to paint. But they all, I guess they all coexist at once. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. OK, cool. Um, so. When, it just depends on the project also that I'm working on. Uh, sometimes I'm invited to exhibit my works and the curator of the exhibit might say we'd really like to focus on the three-dimensional works and the sculpture works. And so um, those are the pieces I begin to execute and think about. And, um, and then in other instances, I might be invited to a portfolio project and then in that case, um, it's a series of prints that I would be working on. Um, so I guess that would be my answer to that question. And how did you, I, when I, um, when, when I first met you, you were largely, um, had just finished your MFA and you had been doing installation art as well, which is not something that you've done a lot of recently. How has, um, 
why is printmaking so specifically, like, as, a, as an artist, why does that resonate for you as a medium? Um, I think it's the layers that I can create with a print, and I'm very seduced by the different processes, be it a collagraph plate, a dry point plate, um, a litho stone, a screen print. Um, they're really different tools like a pencil or a brush um, or even a carving tool to another artist, and um, I just gravitate towards those, those methods and the processes. I also believe that a lot of the projects that I coordinate with printmaking connect me with con community and with the different artists. Um, I find that my closest friends are, are always far away. You know, uh, you and your family are in Oklahoma and we don't get to see each other very much, but when I put together a project and Marwan's in it, there's this anticipation of that work coming and knowing that um, he's creating something that's going to be coming into a project and there's a conversation, a visual conversation and also a heart conversation of um, each of the artists putting their heart and soul into making a piece and I'm um, having those pieces come to my home or into my studio. Um, so printmaking makes that possible. I think I've done um, exchanges with other artists as far as um, some painting exchanges, but it's always interesting to me when it's a different art form that artists will say, well, I can't, you know, painting isn't as easy as printmaking. We can't make multiples. And I said, it's the same thing. You just have to agree to let the work go. And I think that's, those are all reasons why I gravitate, gravitate towards printmaking um, because it answers so many things within my art process and my um, need to connect with different artists in many locations. That's a great sort of segue to the other question that I had for you, which had to do with, and I realize that I don't have my phone out, so I'm going to make sure I don't lose track of our time, um, is that for in your work, um, the broader that you have traveled, the broader and bolder uh, your imagery has become. I think that's a fair assessment to say. And so can you describe the, um, the, um, the why the traveling is so important, um, not just obviously for your opportunity to get out, but what else does it provide to you? Um, when I was really young, my parents um, took us across the whole United States and into Mexico. And when we traveled, I think one of the things my father wanted us to see was just how the world is and, and in different locations and for us to be comfortable with travel. And I think in a lot of um, Navajo families, I find that Navajos in general, I don't know, maybe it's a stereotype, but I think we travel a lot and we're always going places. And I always tease people, uh, oral net tease people, but I have this joke that I say, every time I think I'm going someplace new, some Navajo's already been there. <laughs> <laughs> and so nothing's ever new. And, um, but the experience of going and meeting people and seeing them in their landscape and in their homeland and trying their food and making a connection through what's important to them has, um, been something within me, and I think um, I have to thank my parents um, for that. Um, and when I go to each place, I'm not like a tourist traveling from one destination to the next, but I'll stay in a community and we'll be working on art projects or talking about different things. And so there's really this um, sort of family connection that gets built with the traveling. and. Um, so it's always interesting when I talk to different people who've been to, you know, to France or to Russia, and they're talking about all of these touristy places that they've, they've been to, and I'll be talking about a community and um, events that we've uh, created or things that we've done together that are not part of the regular tourist tra track, and that's something that I think makes my work grow and when I'm doing that, the sketching and the drawing I do becomes um, stronger and just becomes a part of my vocabulary and um, 
strengthens me and strengthens my work. That's, that's really a beautiful way of, of describing all that because I do think that in the work that you've um, been doing, there's an aspect of a sort of self, um, you have a, almost a pictograph that you use to represent yourself that reappears but that pictograph seems to travel all over the world, almost like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with that book, um, that Stanley, that he travels all over, and you yes. know, he's a little flat piece of paper, he gets mailed this way and that way, and in a, in a manner of speaking, your motif travels through your prints to yeah. these places. And it seems like the, um, those symbols are both personal, but also borrowed. And I wonder, um, could, do you mind talking about that just yeah. a little bit? Um, I think when I go to different places in the beginning, um, when I'm out of place, I'm a little hesitant to, um, in a sense, borrow or maybe take an image. Um, but over time, when I become comfortable and really connect with the place, um, I think there's a, a certain uh, sort of asking or um, permission given to use different things. And I always stress with my students that are non-Indigenous or don't come from a place of, of images and symbols that they, there's a certain process that you have to go through to um, either acquire information or um, earn it. And I say, you know, you just don't take an image and use it in, in your work. You want to learn about it. You want to connect with it, become educated about it and earn the right to, to use that. And so when, when I'm in different places, we, I talk with people about what a symbol or an image means to them. And, and in that informal way, um, feel that we come to a comfortable place where I'm either given permission to use it and, and then it comes into the work. At times, some of the symbols or things that I use, I think you see them in many different cultures. and we speak about that common uh, image. You know, you see the, the spiral or what they call in New Zealand, the koru, um, is used in many different places and signifies different things to many people. Um, I think when I first started using it um, in undergraduate and uh, graduate school, I remember people would ask me about it. And at that time, it would represent to me um, sort of time passing. And I would have it in a piece that would travel across the surface of of a print or a work and there was a spiral image and people would say is that the sun or what is you know and I'd say well for me that would symbolize just time passing and, and then as time went on I would meet different people and hear what what that symbol represented to them and um, and then use it in the work and and it would show up in different ways so I think I'm not sure if that answers your question but um, that's that's how I'm understanding it at this point. Well, I think you, that was a, it was, it did answer it, but it makes me really think about, you, you bring up an issue of that thing that um, I think within the native communities, we kind of recognize the certain designs, um, certain repeated motifs from a Western perspective, they're just design elements. But in our uh, traditional indigenous cultural um, philosophies, they can s often, and I'm not going to say always because you never know. Right. You, as soon as you say always, somebody will say, oh, but what about this? Right. Um, but, you know, that they have meaning attached to them in a way that is, is in, in my own readings about semiotics is really, semiotics just barely even gets at the depth and the layers of meaning that these design references can um, have layered meaning that mm -hmm. one grows in your understanding. So it never... Um, it's never mutually exclusive. Lend to one another or open up doors to having a deeper knowledge about these things. But you mentioned the idea, which I think is really valid, and I think the students would be very interested in hearing you describe. So, you know, there's this idea in contemporary Native arts. I'm getting away from our questions. Are you okay That's with that? That's fine. Okay. I could. <laughs> um, Let's go there. <laughs> there's, this, there's this idea in contemporary art in general you know, that nothing new can be done and that appropriation is a manner of artistic process and the accountability and responsibility related to appropriation um, is really legislated, right? Like, it's as, you can do as much as the law will allow. 
I think within our native communities, there's a different feeling about these designs because they do represent, they are basically our visual text for our philosophy and our beliefs. Um, right. And so, you know, if you could maybe take one example, I don't know if that's possible, but to talk about, you know, what are the things that you had to learn or feel to, to get to a point where you could feel comfortable using right. a design? And I'm not trying to put you on the spot, yeah, but if there's no, something no, no. that is, is obvious to you, this is a good yeah. example to show what you meant by that. I think m yeah. some of these students have never had to think about appropriation right. from a cultural perspective. Well, there's, there's many different situations, and one of my personal situations was, I think it was on my fourth, uh, third or fourth trip to New Zealand, and I had a, a Maori artist, a young Maori artist, say, we've noticed that there's some images that look similar to ours in your work, but you haven't really incorporated too much of what we do with your work, and do you feel you know, that we're not present. And I, I, I was sort of taken aback because I, I had been trying to not really use anything and um, to not cross that boundary. And, um, and then we started this conversa conversation about it. And, they, and this one particular person said, you know, I feel like you've been here a couple of times, but, but it doesn't show in your work. And, um, and it makes me feel like you haven't accepted us and I said oh my gosh like I do and I just I am in a sense in waiting to feel the right time to go there and now with this question and and then talking with other artists um, about it 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 felt like it was put into a better place that I was sort of um, given permission in different different ways not like formally with a, a certificate but just um, acknowledged in different situations that that it was appropriate. I've been in other situations as as a professor teaching, and in one situation, I had a, um, a tribal member from one group who, who went to visit um, a a community and took from that community images from a site that was uh, very special and sacred, and incorporated into a painting and a work that they were doing and then I had a student from that community come to my class and I noticed he was very agitated one day and I asked him you know what what's going on are you okay and he mentioned that this person was using cultural images from his sacred place and that a class had made a trip there and this person took the imagery so I said, well, did you talk to the person? And the student said, um, I tried to. So I went to see the student it was from a different tribal group. And I talked with him and said, you know, you, you've sort of crossed the boundaries and you're using imagery from a sacred place that you were invited to. And you have to go through initiation and be part of the society to use that. And you shouldn't be using it. And it was interesting because the person I was speaking to was native, but grew up in an urban setting and wasn't of that tribal group. And the argument then went, um, well, you should be paying me for my time and um, what grade am I gonna get in this project if you tell me to stop? I've already put 16 hours into this project and if you were to stop me, I would want to be paid $25 an hour. It just turned into sort of this ridiculous situation. and. So I always tell people, because I have people who sometimes say, um, I'm not indigenous, so I don't understand. And I just say it's just a question of respect and um, learning where different boundaries are and always, in a sense, asking for permission or earning a right. And, and it's OK to ask questions about when is, when is something appropriate and, um, and trying to do the research for an image and um, seek the counsel of somebody from a community and that's all valuable work that we do as artists and um, and it was interesting we within that situation we spoke with the teacher and then the teacher then got involved and worked with that student but then it was a whole nother layer of of things of, of just out of the whole native realm but it be, went into the realm of just male and female because you know a female professor was talking to the student 
a student wouldn't listen to me, but then we brought in a male professor and he told them you should stop and then the student immediately stopped. So I always say the, some of these questions go into the realm of native things, but also we're dealing with many years of colonization and those types of things enter into some of the conversations we have that are about um, image and how, how and when we use them. So those are two, I guess, different uh, different examples of, of experiences I've had in my lifetime and um, and they're ongoing you know things always come up like um, out of both of those it was the conversation and allowing the community who that image belonged to kind right. of invite you or whomever yes. into using it and I think that's that that um, invitation is the beginning of dialogue which I know a lot of us feel very strongly that the dialogue is key Searching with Native communities at any level, whether it's historical or art or um, image. Yes, and it's also, it's very, very important to remember within the dialogue, um, I've had situations with people who have begun the dialogue, but it's, and it's within the community, but it really depends on who, who is in that community and the background of that person, mm -hmm. because not every single Native person was raised in traditional ways. Um, some, some Natives might have a Christian background, a Mormon background, a Catholic background, and with those different backgrounds and histories, there's different ways in which they perceive their, their culture and way of doing things. So I always tell people that, you know, it's, it's a touchy thing to get into, and, um, and it's just, it takes a lot of time and research to look into something. Um, there's many different points of view on, on one question. Mm. So um, actually thinking about that, and it kind of come, brings us to this idea that I wanted to think about is this um, Navajo idea of walk in beauty. And mm -hmm. so the first thing I might ask you to do is maybe describe for the students what that, mean, what, what that philosophy is at a basic level but then how it informs your work, because I think what you're describing is finding a way of being in balance with yes. those images that's responsible and yet allows you to be creative and have that creative freedom. So, Right. Um, well, walk in beauty for me, and again, this is coming from my background and where I'm coming from, um, because again, you can ask uh, another Navajo from a different part of the reservation and they'll have another answer. So for me and, and the way I was raised, um, it it's a sense of looking at the world in, in a good way, in a positive way, and trying to bring the positive into being and thinking things in, in a good way. And um, part of the, the work I do and how I approach my teaching is to try to, to face it in that way. Um, think good thoughts, move in a good way. If you're in a situation where things aren't good, um, my my way is to to back away from it and give it time to you know sort itself out in time and to just try to um, do the best I can in, in any situation that I'm in um, make the work with the best intentions and and at times you know um, something has to be put away for a while for it to rest to, to move into whatever place it needs to be before you can interact with that piece, that work, uh, that action. And um, that's a very, I don't know, it, I'm describing it in many ways on different levels. It can be interacting with uh, your artwork. It can be uh, interacting with a situation within a classroom. But there's lots of ways that, that we walk in beauty and that we see, see ourselves and try to keep balance within the world. And, um, how I was brought up was also that good and bad always exist together. Not everything is good and not everything is bad. And our job is to, you know, work through these situations in our lives to try to always stay in the middle ground. Um, and it's not an easy task, but um, when I talk about the work I do, that's where I try to go. When I um, in the early years of making a lot of my work, I did installation work and I did a lot of work that was based on um, what's happened with our people in history. And 
when you're researching that and making work every day that with that information, it's very draining and very sad. Um, I think it made me very angry about the world and how things were. And I realized that a lot of times the people that I was trying to reach in different conversations um, would be the people who would come into a room and see this angry work and, and just like, oh my God, angry native, I need to get out of here. <laughs> and, and you just, I would just see these people that I really wanted to be reaching, leaving a room or just like kind of rolling their eyes. And um, so I realized when I started to make the work that is sort of childlike or playful and happy, it made me happy. And it also, you know, made people stay longer for an artist talk. And then when they'd stay longer for an artist talk, you know, they'd be like, oh, look at this little special native woman. And she's so nice. And these colors are so nice. And then, then I would start talking about what was happening within my community, what was happening at home and the difficult things. And, and then they would, because they were caught off guard with, I guess, the honey, they, they would begin to learn <laughs> and they'd be open to listening and hearing some of these things that, you know, maybe a piece that um, would be very confrontational would be very hard for them to, to look at. So um, any, that's a long answer for the question of how we walk in beauty. And, and I've had to, I still negotiate that every day. It's, it's a constant thing of trying to stay in a good place. Well, let's talk about the everyday and today. And what are you working on now that you're excited about that you could share with uh, our students so they could yeah. kind of see your process? I was showing you all this earlier. It's called um, uh, Histories Beyond Homeland, uh, artwork by Melanie Yazzie. And it's now on exhibit at the University of Denver Museum of Anthropology. And um, I did a series of paintings and on handmade paper about um, traveling and looking out the plane window and seeing all the farmland changing below. And, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of times, you know, we're flying over this U.S. and this country we live in, and a lot of this land belonged to Native people. And to see it all being, you know, uh, used and um, controlled, it's, it's really amazing to see it change over the years. I think when I was in... Um, high school I went to a Quaker school outside of Philadelphia and I would fly back to Pennsylvania and I'd always notice all the open space and just different spaces that would be available and now when I fly I notice over the years more and more land is being you know taken up and and controlled and planted on and it's just something that that I noticed so I made a series of work about that speaking about our, our histories and in each of the paintings I put um, a river as, as a symbol of hope. And when I was working on these pieces, it was also the same time that the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, had spilled all this um, chemical waste from mine tailings into the Animas River here in Colorado. And it's, you know, slowly made its way down to the Navajo Reservation. And when it first happened, um, they informed different people in Colorado, but strangely enough, nobody called like New Mexico or Arizona to let them know what was coming their way. And it was just, um, it was interesting because we often think in this way, this time of um, us going into an election year of how each state or region is separate, but then you have an action like the river that is, um, you know, has this horrible chemical spill in it go through all these states within a couple of days. And it reminds people, yes, we are connected. We are connected in so many different ways. And um, anyhow, I'm like getting off on a crazy tangent. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Um, <laughs> but it was, it, it was meant to be positive. But then when the river thing happened, um, it was funny. We had the opening last week. And um, I was talking about riverways and byways here at home, but then I started this series when I was in New Zealand and there was a Maori man who did uh, an introduction at the opening and we both, like, he started talking and then um, I started talking about my, and here we are in this public space 
and you know this grown man that could be my dad we're both crying and talking about our land and and the rivers and how things are so important to us and what was supposed to be just an opening turned into this place of learning and cultural connections and it was so evident in that the work that i do it connects people um he knew pretty much a lot of the people that i've i've met to and ran into in new zealand and we tracked it all the way back to the early 1990s when he first started coming to denver um, and working on the um, indigenous film festival which he's um, here for so it's just it's incredible how art making and um, the projects that we do when you're really passionate about the work you're making uh, it's you can't help but connect with community with people and and that's what I'm constantly working on so when we talk about what work I'm doing now it's the work I've always been doing but there's just different um, sections of it that touch on different things but when I think I'm zeroing in on a certain thing it automatically then touches so many other things in my life and my experience. The world just always keeps getting smaller and smaller. Everything is it, more connected than we imagine. It's true. It's very true. Um, I'd like to ask the students, um, we have a few minutes if anybody has questions. Does anybody have a question? <laughs> oh, there's a, there's a hand up in the audience. It's Mr. Marwin Begay. Oh, wonderful. Hi, Marwin. Hello. Hear him? Yes. Um, it, it goes both ways. Sometimes I have drawings, like I can show you this. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, it's a whale. Yeah, I was um, looking up different images of whales the other day and just doing some drawings and then went to the television and they had the aurora borealis and whales jumping up in uh, another part of the world. And, um, and then I said, you know, this drawing then can work into an art piece. And so I'll have a lot of sketches of different things and then slowly they work themselves into artwork. But I always say to my students who are learning how to do printmaking that if they're in uh, Relief 101 or <laughs> just the very beginning of a process, I tell them they have to draw their project out completely and assign the colors and figure out their mapping of how to make a print because it's easier for me to assist them and help them and we can use it as a map to um, see what they're thinking of how they're going to make the print is so oftentimes I that question that you ask about where it begins it's it's a different answer for each situation and I always like to clarify that because I always have students who are listening to visiting artists and they say they just do anything they just go for it <laughs> and I say well I need you to make a map of your print so we can figure out how you're going to make that piece and with any process once you get to that place where you're really comfortable with screen printing with relief with lithography there's so many ways in which you can then jump to different things or um, just draw directly onto the stone or carve out a plate and just go for it but when you're in the beginning stages with with printmaking i always say it's it's really good to have a map of where you're going to go and once you know how to do the process um, you can just uh, let those um, you know those guidelines put them to the side and go forward. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Marwin. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. <laughs> does anyone else have questions? I, um, does anybody else? I have some things that I can tell them. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, you have a really amazing professor there, uh, Marwin, who is really great. And um, you're very, very lucky to have him. Um, he's an incredible resource and he has so many different ideas that he can share with you and give him so I want to you know let you guys know from another artist that um, that those things are really important to acknowledge I think at times 
um, when you're going through school, you just have this person telling you what to do and giving you advice that makes your life sometimes really hard, but they're really good things. <laughs> and um, so just remember that. And the program that you're a part of right now that's um, Skyping in with me and with the exhibit that's put together, that's put together by Heather and her staff. And it's not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of planning and thinking and organizing. So make sure that all of you thank the museum for, for doing these things. Um, when they get letters from students saying thank you, those are um, things that they can show to the people that are higher up and donors that can help give money to either acquire different artworks or to make other programming happen. So your small report or paper that you might write in response to these uh, Skype talks that you're having are really valuable, so don't don't forget to do that. Um, and the other thing is, just keep making your work no matter what. You know, you may have a difficult critique, but it's it's difficult because it's meant to make you stronger. I always tell my students, if we sat around telling you how great you are you are all the time, you wouldn't improve and you wouldn't get stronger. So it's really important to hear the critiques and hear them as uh, things that are making you and your work stronger. It's important to hear. And just always be making work. It's important. And do the research. Research is so valuable. Thank you for that word from our sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> that was perfect. Well, um, if you guys would just join me in uh, thanking Melanie for her time today. Um, awesome. And um, so our next Skype event, and thank you, Melanie. That was awesome. Yes, you're welcome. Hold, hold on, because I want to talk to you. Okay, I'm going to stay here. Okay, or I can call you on the cell phone, whatever you no, want. No, no, I want to be right here. Okay, <laughs> so um, our next Skype <laughs> event is Windy Red Star um, on the 26th, and I hope you will uh, attend that and tell your classmates to join you. And then on November 16th, we have Nick Tuhara, who is uh, going to be <laughs> Skyping in from uh, New Zealand. Melanie, where does Nick live? Do you remember what city he oh. lives in? Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, um, Nick lives down near Hastings. So uh, ha Hastings, New Zealand. And yeah. um, this is, let me just tell you guys, we are working so hard for his 30 minutes because he's an international artist and so it's with the university it's pretty complicated. Really hope that you'll join us because we will not have very many opportunities to um, engage with the artist from there uh, until I can come up with another good idea. So he's, and he's amazing. He's so, he's so generous and wonderful. You guys are going to love him. So um, as far as like the museum, um, our current exhibitions, Immortalis, Enter the Matrix are still up. We have opened this Distinguished Visiting Artist James Searles exhibition. That is um, up. That one is the shortest of what we have, so please make sure you stop by. It's one of the prettiest exhibitions that we've mounted here at the museum. Um, and we are closed, so if you'll go ahead and exit straight up, um, the security would appreciate not having to taser you or chase you back down. <laughs> So, um, and with that, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate every one of you who made your time today for us.